Until the late 1800s and early 1900s, this place was mostly seen as an unexplored landmass at the bottom of the world. It was an incredibly difficult place to get to, and even if ships could make it through the stormy southern ocean, it was an intense battle just to survive. Food was scarce, the weather was harsh, journeys were hard and long, and no one was here to help them if something went wrong. This time in Antarctic history is known as the Heroic Age, and many of the men who spent long months in dark, cold isolation are remembered for paving the way for future Antarctic research and exploration. Primarily they were out-and-out -out explorers. Um, they wanted to get to the pole, that was the main driver, that was the race. Um, but there was also scientific justification in terms of advancing geographical science, understanding um, the pole, which was really a new environment for them. Some of the shelter huts that were built during this time still stand today thanks to the work of historical preservationists. And when we go inside of these huts, we can see many of the articles that these explorers had to leave behind. Books, diaries, clothing, bedding, boots, shoes, food, unfinished lab work. Over a hundred years later, we can still feel this legacy of these early Antarctic explorers, and we can appreciate the first footprints that they have left for future generations to follow. Over the next 50 years, the focus shifted from exploration to scientific research. By 1957, worldwide attention began to focus on the value of polar research. The scientific community came together and launched an immense scientific event that lasted 18 months. Countries around the world poured money and resources into new scientific research that sparked much of the technology and knowledge that we use today in the 21st century. This global effort was known as the International Geophysical Year, or the IGY, and research spanned from the Arctic to the Antarctic and everywhere in between. During World War II, a lot of new technology had been developed for combat purposes to fight the war. And a little over 10 years later, this technology could be used for new scientific purposes, especially in Antarctica, a place that we knew so little about. It was around this time that the United States was establishing the McMurdo Air Facility, which would later become McMurdo Station. And a few kilometers away, New Zealand was establishing Scott Base. Now, in Wellington, New Zealand, at Victoria University, two young geology students were watching this all happen from a distance, and they were very curious about what was going on. They were to become an integral part of the International Geophysical Year and set a legacy that has impacted Andrew and many other geoscientists working in Antarctica today. In, I think it was 1955, I was a freshman at Victoria University and went along on the first day of registration and accidentally registered in a geology class. And uh, the next week when classes began, that's where I first met Barry McCulvey. It's a friendship that's uh, gone on ever since we first met. Well, I guess it all goes back to 1957. Uh, Peter Webb and I were third year geology students at Victoria University of Wellington. And of course, that was the year that uh, things were becoming geared up for IGY. And in the midst of one extremely boring lab class, namely paleontology, we could hear the uh, reverberating, uh, reverberating sound of the globe masters flying overhead as they came from Auckland down to Christchurch, bringing equipment for McMurdo. It was a constant loud noise in the sky, and this further reinforced my interest in Antarctica. Uh, and then in uh, 57, early 57, uh, Barry McCulvey and I suddenly decided that we had to satisfy this desire and so we started making our first plans. We volunteered to go down as helpers, uh, unpaid helpers, in any sort of capacity to work with and help with the American IGY program. After securing a spot through the American military attaché as cargo handlers, Peter and Barry made their first trip to the Antarctic. Near the end of their season, the Transantarctic Expedition arranged helicopter support to take a small group of scientists into the dry valleys, 
which are a spectacular geological feature virtually unknown to the world at the time. The three biologists of the expedition had room for one more, and after offering the chance to Peter and Barry, it was agreed that Peter would take the opportunity. So it was not until uh, Debenham, you've seen the name of Debenham on the map, Frank Debenham was, was Scott's cartographer who made the first beautiful maps of this area. And uh, he, uh, if you have a look at his maps, there's this great big blank area in the middle here uh, with no information. And that's what happened in the IGY, in the International Geophysical Year. No one had been in here, and that's when we came in and started the first geological surveys. Uh, when we left the valley, uh, we certainly had only scratched the surface. Uh, I'd managed to make a very uh, crude reconnaissance map for the geology. And uh, as happens in Antarctica, you often create more questions than you do answers. And so I left very dissatisfied. I knew that we had to come back, and we did come back 12 months later. At this time, Peter returned with three others, his friend Barry McKelvey, their biology professor Dick Barwick, and their physics professor Colin Bull. Their legacy is remembered on the maps of the Dry Valleys today, with Barwick Valley, McKelvey Valley, Bull Pass, and Webb Glacier named after them. I've always thought that they did their job so well that season that really they set the scene. And, uh, and then we had then got permission to run a university party, the yeah. uh, VY2, oh. to, to the base. Now, is that the truth, or that's do you a, think...? That's very, very close to the truth, <laughs> you know. <laughs> truth, number one, depends on how long ago it was, and, and uh, two, in our age. who's telling it. <laughs> yeah. The second expedition uh, was centred in Wright Valley. In those days, sometimes, it used to be known as the Grand Canyon of Antarctica. And it was just an obvious place to go because it was absolutely unique. It's uh, largely, uh, doesn't have very much uh, glacial moraine on the floor of it. It's been scraped out, and so you can see the geology very spectacularly on the floor and in the walls. In the first two expeditions, in 57, 58, 58, 59, there were only four of us in the entire Dry Valley area for the entire summer, so it was a very lonely place. We had to learn Morse code, and uh, we would report back to McMurdo or Scott Base about once a week, sometimes once every 10 days, uh, just to say we were alive. In fact, the area was so little known that Colin Bull had to find the latitude and longitude uh, of our uh, main base because there was just no map in, in existence. So we, we were extraordinarily lucky. I mean, we got the almost first bite. Yeah, oh, sure we did. And the beautiful thing was that whatever you did was brand new. We certainly did a lot of walking. Everything was done on foot and we wore out multiple pairs of boots. And Anson gave us, I think, two pairs of boots. Two pairs of me. boots each. Of which Barry and Peter wore out a pair. Yeah, it was yeah. something like almost 300 miles of walking. 500 um, miles of walking yeah, you, and, well, and 40,000 feet of climbing. We had to bring our own food from New Zealand. Our food cost us nothing, zero. I wrote large numbers of letters, all of which started, Dear Sir, I write on behalf of the Victoria University of Wellington Antarctic Expedition 1958-59. This expedition, like most scientific ventures of these years, finds itself greatly in need of financial support. And the, the response was just magnificent. They provided chocolate and egg powder and orange juice, so everything was donated. 